as you may know, the next topic is the negative impact of Al-Wah. Al-Wah. And we spoke this morning about the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he gave decisive, clear, plain definition of Al-Wah. قَالَ حُبَّ الدُّنْيَا وَكَرَهِيَةِ الْمَوْتِ he said the one, the definition of one for those who are not here, the messenger of Allah said the love of this dunya and the hatred of death. But today we're going to be talking about how that wah, that penetrated our bones, our heart and our mind, how and what area that one really affected us. So the first of the status of the first thing that a wah really affected us as a Muslims, is that wahan in aqidah itself. When you are a mu'min, when you are a Muslim, when you are someone who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-izzah, izzah al-nafs, izzah al-islam should be something that you're proud of. It should be something, the first thing that you should, you know, introduce someone to about yourself is I am a Muslim. That is the core of the aqidah. But unfortunately, Al-Wahan penetrated our deen, our aqidah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Al-Yawma ya'isa al-ladheena kafaru min deenikum. Fala takhshaw, wakhshaw. Today, and he's talking to the sahaba, to the nabi, and to us, but the kuffar that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in particular addressing here is the kuffar of Quraysh. And those who are in the same mentality and manhaj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Al-Yawma Ya'isa. They gave up on your aqidah. They're no longer able to change your court, to change your faith, to change your deen. They no longer have the, the, the intention and the desire of changing you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, in that, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-islam deena. And subhanallah, Allah is saying, today I have perfected your religion. I have perfected your aqidah. There is nothing that you need to borrow from someone else or from some, you know, and innovated, innovated matters to perfect and to add and to conclude your deen. Allah said, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. But we realize that because of al-wahan that is being covered the ummah, that for some members of the ummah, that penetrated their aqidah. And maybe it may not be too obvious in this country where you can, you know, proudly wear your hijab, wear your niqab, wear your kufi, wear your thob, wear your qutra, wear your, you know, whatever culture you come from, you can wear whatever you want to wear. But where I'm from, it's not the same. And the Muslims, instead of, you know, instead of holding on to the robe of Allah, they became, you know, weak in their aqidah. I witness in my lifetime that which I would never thought I would witness. I witness some members of a Muslim politicians in the country that I'm from or live. That they drop their aqidah, they drop their deen because if he doesn't do this, he may not win the election, the upcoming election. He may not win the vote of the disbelievers. So what he did, when he went, they went out. And he started washing the idols of the people that they are asking their votes from. Subhanallah. They went, they never went to the masjid and prayed to Allah. But they went to these people so they can win their vote. And they start saying, what do you do to your gods? And the person who was teaching me said, if you want our God to bless you, you have to wash him with the blessed water. And this man by the name, so-called Muslim name, he started taking a piece of cloth and washing their gods. That is a wahan 
in the aqidah itself. I have seen those people and they ask him, pray and we, our God would be yours. And the man did this. It's not one, it's not two, it's not three, it's not one location. I'm not pinpointing individuals, but this is a current, you know, a current thing, an occurring thing in the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because of al-wahn, al-amal, wahn in ethics of work. As a Muslim ummah, we don't work like a Japanese. We don't work like the Chinese. We don't work like the true Muslims. I'm talking about in general. Because we were taught you're not good enough. You can't do it. Let somebody else work for you. Let somebody else invent invent for you. See, when I come to Malaysia, I feel so proud. You know, today, yesterday when they're picking up, picking me up from the airport and I opened the car and I think it was last night when I opened the car, the door's car or the car, the door of the car, I asked, who made this car? Where this car was made and they say, local. I hope they are made by Muslims. I hope. I feel so good, so proud. Why now I can go back and I said I have seen Muslims working hard. Muslims, you know, you know, making things for themselves. I have seen Muslims who not, you know, Allah, they not, you know, extra weight on other nations. You know, most of us, most of the Muslims, everything that we were is made by someone else. Everything that we write, every mount is made by someone else. Every chair that we sit on is made by someone else. Every device that we use is made by someone else. Every airplane that I'm on or in is made by someone else. Even Muslim weapons is made by someone else. I mean, Ummah, that is 2.2 billion. And it, is a, it relies on someone else. No. No, no. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. And the, the funny thing is, every intelligent, every Muslim that has, you know, brilliant mind, the West, they say, welcome. Welcome. We'll give you citizenship. We'll give you, you know, house. We give you a car. We give you anything that you just come and produce for us. Under our banner, under our name, under our, our flag. But when it comes to Muslims, they don't utilize the talent and the resource that the Muslims have. In Islam, we are not allowed to rely on others. You have to be independent. You have to stand on your feet. One of the Sahaba of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he came to the Messenger of Allah and he said, Ya Rasulullah, help me out. And Messenger of Allah, he looked at him. He has no reason for him to extend his hand. So he said, do you have anything at home? He said, yes. He said, what do you have? He said, hint. Hell is a, a thick, harsh type of carpet or a mat. He said, I only have that. Part of it I sleep, we sleep on it. And the other part we cover ourselves with. He said, do you have anything else? He said, I have a little container where we cook with, where we shower with, where we use it for wudu. And the messenger of Allah said, go back and bring them to me. Go back. See, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't say, Oh, you a poor man. You only have these two simple things? Oh, ya yeah, Abu Bakr. Give him something. Ya yeah, Sa'ad bin Rabi'ah. Give him more sadaqah. Ya yeah, Usaid bin Hudayr. Go back to your tribe and get something for this man. But the Messenger of Allah said, Go back and bring them to me. 
So he brought them to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to the Sahaba, who will buy this? Who will buy it? And one of the Sahaba said, Ya Rasulullah, one dirham. I'll buy it for one dirham. The messenger of Allah said, No, man yazidu ala hada. Who can give me more for this? And one of the Sahaba said, Two dirhams, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Give it to me. Take them away. See, the mentality of Rasulullah, sallallahu entrepreneurship. The messenger of Allah said, Now you have two dirham. Go feed your family with one dirham and buy an axe for another. Just to buy the head of the axe. So he came, he said, bring him to me. And he asked one of the Sahaba of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to give him a branch, a thick branch, and he put on the axe. He said, go get some wood and don't come back to me after, before 15 days, before 15 days. So this Sahabi he went to the jungle, went to whatever he was, and he started cutting trees and coming, bringing something to the city. And after 15 days, he comes back, you know, fed his family, dress well, have extra money for sadaqah. And the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Sahih al-Bukhari or Muslim, he said, Al-yad al-uliya khayrun min yad al-sufla. He said, the upper hand is better than the lower hand. Now, as a Muslim nation, and I'm not putting us down, we mostly are the, and the lower hand. Not because we lack of resources, not because we lack intellect, but we cannot work together effectively and produce something. So there is al wahan in the ethics of work, in the work ethics, or al wahan ifi majal al amal. There's also al wahan fil akhlaqiyat. You know, al wahan weakness in the manners. In the behavior. Al-akhlaqiyat doesn't mean, you know, I smile at you and you smile at me only. Al-akhlaqiyat means, you know, your lifestyle. Wahan in the way we live as Muslims. There's a wahan in you and I as a Muslim. I'm not talking about the brothers and sisters sitting right here. I'm talking about in general as an ummah. Every time that we say we and you, I'm talking about ummah to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whether they are in China, whether in Nigeria, whether in Somalia, whether in Palestine, I'm talking about us. And whether we are from the West or East. al akhlaqiyat Abdullah ibn Mas'ud used to warn and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was a sahabi as we know he used to tell the people لا تكونوا إمعا قال وما الإمعا يا ابن مسعود قال من قال إذا أحتد الناس أحتدوا أو إذا أحسن الناس أحسنوا he said don't be إمعا they said what is إمعا he said don't be a follower when people do good I do good if people do bad well I'm part of the society unacceptable if people do good, you do better. If people do bad, you do still better. You don't follow anybody but Allah. You don't have to follow anyone but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is your role model. When people do good, we do good. When people do bad, we still do good. Have you seen some of us nowadays going into unacceptable event that is against the core of our faith, our akhlaqiyat. And they dance with this certain people. They, you know, they try to win them over. They go to that event knowing that Allah has cursed similar people just, just to blend in. You know, I feel bad for some people because we don't see the reality elsewhere. Sometimes we live in a little bubble and we think, oh, no, 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 I don't have that in my society. I don't have that in my community. I don't have that. Guess what? We're all together in this. Akhlaqiyat, the way I live, should be according to the deen of Allah and the sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because Allah told me, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٍ No one else. 
And I should be among those people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, الَّذِينَ إِنْ مَكَّنَّاهُمْ الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمْ النَّاسِ إِنَّ إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ فَخْشَوْهُمْ You have to be among those people when people say to them, Oh, everybody is against you. Everybody is against you. So you better fear them. You should say, no. No, I only fear Allah. I only fear Allah. الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسِ إِنَّ النَّاسِ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ فَخْشُ People say, people, everybody is against you. If you don't do this, you have to do this. You know, in, in my community where I'm from, which is some of the struggle that we have in the West, we have imams who saying to the girls or the young ladies who wants to increase their modesty to a comfortable level to them and they wear a niqab. They say, no, 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 no. Don't wear niqab in a public places. Do not wear niqab in the university. Do not wear niqab in, in you know, in, in the malls because you bring attention to yourself. And instead of saying, may Allah be with you. Keep holding on to the sunnah of the Sahaba, sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and keep following. We became weak in our manners and akhlaqiyat. Al-Wahan also penetrated our politicians. <laughs> oh, and I'm not, by the way, by the way, I don't, I'm not talking about a certain nation. I'm, talk, I'm not talking in general. In general, in Muslim, they are good ones, alhamdulillah. They are always good ones. But the politician, the siyasa, the siyasa in Islam, it should not be bent based on the desire of anyone or any constitution. The siyasa that we follow, the sharia of Allah should be the court base, not the custom and the culture. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we don't stand for the truth, Allah will change us and replace us with better people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah said in the Quran, if you move on, if you try to move away from the deen of Allah to please someone else, then Allah will replace you with people better than you. And you also have to understand, Ya Ibadullah, that Allah said in the Quran, no matter what you do for others, they will never be happy with you. وَلَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُ I hope you understand this. I hope those brothers and sisters who are in a higher place in any Muslim country understand what Allah said in the Quran وَلَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى They will never be happy حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُ Until you follow their milla he didn't say, حَتَّى يَرْضُوا عَنْكَ No. حَتَّى يَجْلِسُوا مَعْكَ لا. حَتَّى يُحَادِثُوكُمْ لا. حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ Do you understand? The milla is their way of life, is their deen, is their aqeedah. And ittiba' here doesn't mean you just go and you sit in the you know, you know, conference room with them. No, ittiba means you have to serve. وَلَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى أَنْتَلْ تَتَّبِعَ If you read Surah Al-Kahf, when Musa alayhi salatu wa salam met Al-Khidr, what did he say to Khidr to learn from him? قال هَلْ أَتَّبِعُكَ When a teacher has a student, when the student has a teacher, what is the relationship? The relationship is the relationship of itiba. The students try to serve the teacher. He carries his shoes, he brings his water, he serves them so the teacher can give him something back. Here Allah is saying, they will never be satisfied, they will never be happy with you until you become a taba, servant to them. 
until you kill your own people for them. Until you destroy your own culture for them. I just came back in, in one of the countries in Africa. And in this, they have almost a million Muslims in one area. And in that one million Muslims, subhanAllah, you don't know about this because you live in your own world perhaps. They appointed this man who is from the same region, who speaks the same language, who is supposed to be on the same deen. They appointed over these people. And these people, this man who has been appointed to control that region, he will torture the ulama. He will torture the students of knowledge. And do you know, subhanAllah, do you know some of the crimes? He would ask you to recite the Quran. And if you recite the Quran with tajweed, then you will be sentenced 20 years in prison. 20 years! I just came from that two weeks ago. 20 years. And if you have it, like kitab Allah, if you have it, the Quran, you know what they would do because this is the siyasa of al wahan They will dig a, a hole or, you know, a, a, a deeper place and they will put the hafid in a small area when he cannot sit down or lay down for months. And then they will bring feces. Yani, you know, subhanAllah, human waste. And they will pour over him. And woe to him if they hear him reciting Quran. Woe to him. Who was doing this to him? Another Muslim. And why is he doing? Because he wants to stay in power and he's pleasing the one over him. This is called Al Wahan of his siyasa. Now subhanallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote his roles and responsibility but now that person is in prison and Allah gave that community someone who honors the ulama and ahl al-Quran and rewards them also that's the wahan in siyasa Al-Wahan, I don't know how much time I have. Al-Wahan fi tarbiya wa ta'aleem. Weakness in education and upbringing. Al-Wahan. Weakness in educating our children. Do you know in certain Muslim countries, you cannot teach ayat al-jihad. You cannot teach ayat when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say wa a'iddu lahum. Prepare yourself for them. You cannot teach. You cannot teach Surah to Tawbah in that country to your students. You cannot teach Surah to Al-Anfal in that, in that No. You cannot teach Surah to Al-Ahzab. You cannot teach anything that goes back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his struggle. You cannot teach anything about the battle of Badr. Al-Ahzab. You cannot teach anything about Khandaq. You cannot teach anything that has something to do with the legacy. Of, but you can teach about Surah uh, Al-Kahf. You can teach about Surah Al-Najm. You can teach about Surah Al-Nas. But you're not allowed to teach Surah Al-Anfal and Surah Al-Tawbah and Surah Al-Ahzab. You can why? Because they don't want this little boy and this little girl to know the legacy of his people and her people. They don't want you to know. They don't want you to know when the Sahaba stood against the Mushrikeen of Quraysh that Allah sent angels to defend them. They don't want them to know. They don't want them to know that Aisha radiyallahu anha, that Asma radiyallahu anha, the Sahabiyat used to serve Rasulullah and the Sahaba in the battlefield. They didn't want them to know. Why would they? 
Because when they have that mentality, when they have that love for, you know, greatness, then they will rise. They don't want them to teach them. No, you're not allowed to teach them. They don't want you to teach anything about the enemies of Allah. And soon, I guarantee you soon, anything has to do with Qawm Lut in the Quran will not be taught. It has already not been removed. It will not be taught. Why? Because this is how you upbring the children. You bring them hash. You bring them weak. And we teach our children, you know, about, you know, feminism. We teach our children, you know, how to, you know, be independent. We teach our little girls how to be independent. Of course they're independent. Allah gave them that. But no, according to the Western standards. Where are the mothers in a Muslim country? Where are they, sisters, who used to teach their children? Go and learn the book of Allah. Go and learn the seer of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa The tabi'een and the sahaba. When the child comes to call a kitab, a kitab, or when he comes to the Islamic school, the first tafsir that they used to teach was Surah Al-Anfal and Surah Al-Tawbah. Because this little boy, the tarbiya has to start from there. So Al-Wahan, weakness. Now we teach them about, you know, the movie stars. Allahu Akbar. We teach them about, you know, do you know the best singers? We teach them about, do you know about... No. Because al-wahnu fi tarbiya is how they got us. You know, in the West, subhanAllah. You know, I moved from the West for a reason. Because I couldn't take it. I couldn't. You go to your universities. Look, look how they how they trapped our girls we go to go to the university the little girl goes to the finish high she finishes high school she goes to the university and the first thing that she sees is you know islam 101 and every little girl who went to islamic school from day one in her mind is like i need credit i need better grace so islam 101 is basic it's arcanal islam you know arcanal iman i can pass this with flying colors so every little girl would go and sign for that course hoping that she will learn something easy and simple so she can pass with A and A plus. And this little girl, fresh little girl, sits in front of PhD holder who was educated how to brainwash these young men and women. And the first thing that they teach this Muslim girls and this is Islam 101 in all university, University of Toronto, University of, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Ryerson, Uni York University, exact the same. And these are the university in this country that I live. You know what the first thing that they teach about Islam 101? They tell these little girls, do you know the laws of inheritance? Do you know the laws of your rights? You cannot be equal to your brother. They don't teach them. There are certain situations that the girls have more, much more than any male member in the family. They don't teach them that, but they teach them, you guess what? You're not equal to your brother. This religion of yours suppresses you. She only, the deen gives you only half. They don't teach them that other thing other than that. They teach them, do you know Mulk al Yameen? Do you know? So these little girls, they come out of you know, this university confused. And the mothers themselves are not educated because they did not, if they build their daughters and sons and prepare them for that harsh reality that exists today, then they would have been in a better place. So, Al-Wahnu fi Tarbiya, and my dear sisters in Islam, this message particularly is yours. You have a whole industry, complete industry. And the only ultimate goal that they have is to make sure you are mentally and emotionally corrupted and for you to work against your religion. So be aware of that. The other one, 
that we fall in as an ummah is that one and nafsi, you know, emotional, psychological, psychological. They taught us everything good comes from and elsewhere. They don't teach us, and we don't teach our children that the great, the greatest, you know, invention was initiated by Muslims. They don't teach you that the first one who flew in the history of humanity was Abbas bin Farnas, was a Muslim inventor. They don't teach you that. They don't teach you the first, you know, because this is psychological war. This is psychological warfare. They, they have to teach you that you are less than the rest. And the Muslims have to be aware of that and they need to fight back. Ibadullah. How do we overcome the wah that is overtaking the ummah? One, wa'atasimu bihabli Allahi jami'an wa la tafarraq. Wazkuru ni'mat Allahi alaykum id kuntum a'da'an fa'allafa bayna qulubikum. Ya ayuhal ladina amana ati'u allaha wa rasoola wa la tawal. Ya ayuhal ladina amana ati'u allaha wa rasoola. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, oh, you believe Obey Allah and His message. So the first thing that we need to do is unity. Unity. Second, the second thing that we need to do as Muslims around the world, let us rely on each other. Let us go back and say, if I can't find this soap in Malaysia, where else can I find? Can I find in Pakistan? Yes, it's a little bit expensive, but I'm, you know, I don't care. I'm giving my money to a Muslim. I'm going to invest in the Muslim businesses. Number three, as a mother, you are the, you are the safety pin for Islam. You are the fortress that we cannot go without. If you can shelter as a mother, and educate your children as a strong Muslim, like Safiya, like Asma, like Ai, and in Radiallahu uh, Anhum Ajma'in, then the children of the Ummah. Number four, stand up for the Haqq, for the truth. Stand up for the truth. Because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and the Ulama all agree that we should not deviate from the Haqq. From the haqq. And if this Ummah, it stands for the truth. Even if it was against us, then Allah would bless us. And that's why Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, Allah may, which is Adala, Allah may aid a non-Muslim nation against a Muslim nation if the non-Muslim nation has Adala, has justice. So we have to do that. Number five, work for the future. Build for the future. Put your seat right now and don't worry who is going to reap that. Don't worry who is going to reap it because your job is to make sure you put the seed down and maybe your children or your grandchild can benefit from it. Number six, do everything with sincerity, everything with ikhlas. Everything for the sake of Allah, not to please anyone, not to promote certain things because of this. No, only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number seven, you must realize that I am your ticket to Jannah and you are my ticket to Jannah. I am your mirror and you are my mirror. لذلك النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال المؤمن مرآة أخي You are the mirror of your Muslim brother. If we can accomplish some of this only in our daily lives, Wallahi, we can achieve much more than we can ever anticipate. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you and reward you. وجزاكم الله خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.
Do you ever get worried that your child may click on the wrong video online? Do you wish there was a safe channel for your peace of mind? Well, there is. The number one rated Muslim kids channel in the world, One for Kids TV, is here to solve all these issues. The channel has no advertisements and is safe for your children to browse and watch their favorite videos. With a wide selection of cartoons, songs, educational videos, and much more, your children will not only stay entertained, but also learn so much about their deen. You can listen to songs while your device is switched off and you can download videos to watch them offline. One for Kids TV is 100% run and owned by Muslims, which means the small amount you pay for your subscription is a continuous charity for you, as all the funds raised go towards the production of new cartoons and educational films for your children. The One for Kids TV app is now available on Apple devices, Apple TV, Android devices, Android TV, Amazon Fire TV, and Roku, so you can watch on most devices and smart TVs. Download now for a free 14-day trial. Mm-hmm.